Okay, and uh, we will also go live on Facebook so that uh, when we're finished with the program, uh, everybody can go to Facebook on our page and, and watch the, the event uh, over and share it with their friends at any time. So bear with me for one second here. Uh, let's... Well, I think Faisal, we have you beat in terms of attendance so far. We're up to 79 people tuning in from all over the world. Of course, we have the luxury of tuning in from our the comforts of our home or our offices, wherever we may be. Um, I think it's really incredible that we have this opportunity to uh, join in whatever way we can in today's special exhibit at the Palestine Museum US in Woodbridge, Connecticut on the art of the Palestinian thobe, which are of course the traditional Palestinian dresses that are hand embroidered uh, that's known as tatriz in Arabic. And we'll also get to see some paintings in the museum and photography. Uh, and right now we have a close up of the computer connection. So this is this is technology at its best. Without these connections, without this technology, we wouldn't be able to all join in together the way we are right now. So we are all very grateful for that. Of course, we're we're even more grateful when technology cooperates. So sometimes we have our glitches, but Overall, I think it's quite quite an honor and privilege to be able to all come together and connect from wherever we are, whatever time zone, whatever continent. Eight six three four five three. And again, behind Faisal, there you see the exhibit uh, from Palestine: Our Past, Our Future, which is part of the Venice Biennial Architectural Exhibit. It's just an incredible exhibit in Venice, Italy. You get a chance to make it there. We had the grand opening back in May and it runs through November 26th. I did put a link to the exhibit catalog in the chat and we actually, we actually also have a virtual exhibit of that exhibit that I can put a link to in the chat. If you click on the link, you can watch it later. Um, I don't think you can copy it, but if you click on it, it'll open a browser and then you can just hang on to that or copy the URL and, and um, watch it at your leisure. So you get to just get a taste of it in case you can't I know, make I'm it looking there in person. At it. Behind here. Behind. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. 863. I use this computer all the time. It just it knows it's not where it usually is. <laughs> It's com complaining, being a little testy here. No, it just it's it's picky about security. It, it knows the computer was moved and it right. Thinks somebody, so it's, thinks it's somebody stole it. Up. Yeah. Well, I see now you have another window open. <laughs> okay. So, so we now. can see. We'll be able to see Faisal and see whatever else we're looking at in the museum, okay. which will change as we go well, on. The one thing I should do. Um, which I'm sure everybody would approve with that, is to turn airplane mode on. And Hanan, tell me where you're tuning in from. From New Jersey. You're in New Jersey. And uh, yes. Tabia, New Jersey, where are you? Where we uh, emigrated from uh, Nelson Haifa, Israel, and whatever. And oh my goodness. <laughs> Uh, we've been here all this time. That's where we started our uh, Palestinian Heritage Foundation and uh, did all the activities from basically uh, moving exhibit to exhibit. From, sure. Uh, you know, without a without a building with a, a, a very limited budget, we were trying to establish all the activities that we were able to do. So uh, I'm very happy to join everybody, and I want to thank uh, Faisal for uh, inviting me to this. And it's fantastic thinking about all the people who are on this uh, Zoom meeting from all over the world. It's amazing. Um, welcome. So uh, I wanted to start. Did you want to, uh, Faisal, you want to start the, the show, the actual show? Um, I'll just say a couple of words. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us, uh, and welcome to our program on the art of the Palestinian Thobe. We're um, very excited uh, to have some uh, 
uh, distinguished guests uh, today, and uh, we will be uh, uh, hearing from uh, Hanan uh, momentarily here. Uh, and uh, after Hanan speaks, uh, um, uh, Rima Ghanam uh, will follow, and then uh, Tabea will, will follow that. And following all of that, uh, I will take you on a tour of the relevant portions of the museum uh, 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 material uh, in terms of artwork and photography, etc. Uh, the room you're looking at here is just the function room. This is where we have our events like this and plays and concerts, etc. The, the the bulk of the museum is is behind us out that way. So um, let's uh, since we're behind schedule, we're gonna jump into the the first part of the program, which is. Uh, um, uh, Hanan is going to review with us uh, uh, a fair number uh, of Palestinian films, tell us about them. And uh, as we make our tour of the, of the rest of the museum, we'll be able to, to see those films on the mannequins live. So for now, I'm going to turn it over to Hanan and I'm going to share my screen uh, when Hanan is ready. Are you, are you ready to uh, for my sharing the screen, Hanan? Sure. Should I press it? <clears throat> okay. And um, perhaps I can just briefly uh, say that Hanan is tuning in from New Jersey, and she is a Palestinian American co-founder and president of the Palestinian Heritage Foundation, and she has researched and lectured on Palestinian textile arts for over 20 years. She is the author of Traditional Palestinian Costume, Origins, Origins and Evolutions, so you would want to get a copy of that incredible book. Uh, it's considered the ultimate authority on Palestinian thobes and embroidered textiles. So welcome, Hanan. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, I wanted basically just to explain what we're doing today. Uh, the Palestinian um, uh, Museum that Faisal has been doing fantastic work really has gone from a simple starting museum to quite uh, very active and and, uh, and now they have a, a appreciable amount of uh, costumes from Palestine uh, and this is basically today we'll be going through choices from that collection so that uh, and, and then I would explain the background behind each and, and Hanan if you excuse me for one second I just want to take a moment to thank all the people who've donated the cost, the thobes that you're going to see, all the thobes that are at the museum have been donated uh, either by Palestinians or by people who are very sympathetic to Palestine, who decided that it's better to put these thobes in the museum than leave them in the closet for another 20 years or so. So we, we encourage people to do the same uh, if they have thobes that are in their closet, they haven't used them. Uh, that we have a better place for them to see here. And thank you. Sorry, Hanan, for the interruption. No problem. Basically, there are several collections, large collections all over the world, in the Middle East, in museums all over Europe and the United States, and uh, our collection here, that have represented mostly the 19th century, 20th century dresses uh, with all their glory and beauty. And, and uh, in this uh, collection, you're going to see a few samples of them. But what you will also see here is what happened after the 20th century as people wanted to wear something Palestinian that was more modern, more practical, maybe lighter, maybe cooler, maybe, you know, less fattening. It doesn't put on 20 pounds when you put on the thumb. So they started changing styles, and, and we'll see now basically what we're talking about. I'm sure you've seen the tidbits of it with, with uh, all over the world in your own lives. So let's start off with this. The, the first dress uh, is from Beit Lahia, which is in the Gaza area. It's a gorgeous dress that's uh, quite uh, pure. It hasn't been worked, played around with. Uh, it's in good condition. As you can see, the colors are very bright. The fabric is from El Majdal, and Majdal near uh, in the Gaza area was very famous for its weaving. It had a lot of uh, weaving people. The weaving was done by men, and they would sell this fabric, which is the width of it is from one picking stripe to the other. Very, it, it's at most 18 inches, and um, uh, linen and uh, silk. 
So they became very famous for that uh, fabric. It's sold as a maktab, which is you, you buy a piece that's already eight yards, basically, and uh, make a dress out of it. So the cut of it is the typical Palestinian cut. And I want to highlight cut. It's not only the dress, it's not only the pattern, it's the cut of the Palestinian dress that has survived amazingly from the uh, first, second centuries all the way to the 20th century. The dresses are really cut in the same style. So here is the Beit Lahia. The embroidery is usually done right on the fabric at, around the neckline and on the sides and on the back. And the cross stitch. Now, uh, I don't have the fabric in front of me, so I don't know if the thread is silk or cotton, but it could be DMC cotton because the patterns seem to be more in the 1940s. Uh, Does this help? Yes. And, and oh, oh, actually, I'm, I'm glad you highlighted the neckline. It's a very uh, nice, you see the, the yellow neckline and from it like three fish, which is kind of reproducing some of the silver jewelry that is worn in that area. And it is very decorative. And, and this area is one of my favorite in terms of decoration. It's not very heavy embroidery, but it's done very tastefully. Next. One second, please. Now we go on to this dress. Now, this is what happens to the dresses after a lot of use and a lot of people uh, intervening here. The dress is made from the same fabric. So the stripes that are here pink are uh, faded from the very hot pink color that uh, preceded them. So it's been used and washed a lot. But it's also been uh, played around with in terms of the traditional style. The neckline of the chest piece is from a different uh, dress, from a different area, more towards the Jaffa region. And it, sometimes uh, either the person herself would do that, or most probably the dealers who wanted to sell the item would take from a worn dress, the best piece, put it on another fabric. And it's also embroidered by machine stitching to kind of simulate the cross stitch, but of course, the, it doesn't come close. And the style basically of the patterns, these on the side are fine for, for uh, the Mezdal area, on the back of it is totally different. So it, it's just, uh, it's losing its character. And here are two strips of the orange colors from another dress taken off and put on this dress. So this dress has basically lost its character. And, and I, I'm pointing it out basically because this is what one should not do with the old dresses. If anybody has an old dress from a family member, please leave it alone and do not add or remove or cut or, or change anything in it because the value of the dress is lost, basically. Next. And, and you don't think this was made like this to start with? No. Uh, no? The, the chest piece doesn't belong to it. Mm. And the, the embroidery on the sides is... Uh, one style and the embroidery on the back is a totally different. It's machine embroidery on, by machine and, and uh, totally totally not appropriate to this area. The one on the sides and those those orange stripes you're talking, right? Like this, these, here. these are authentic pieces from other dresses. Oh, I see. Yeah. But they've been put on the wrong uh, dress. Okay. You're making a hybrid dress. Yes. Next, okay. please. Next. Now, here is a beauty of uh, Palestinian uh, embroidery, the Bethlehem Melech dress. And I wanted to uh, stop a little bit on this and, and point out several things. First of all, it's very famous. It's the, the fabric was locally uh, woven and it's bought again as a maqta, which means it's uh, 18 inches wide and you buy about eight yards of it to make one dress. and at the end of the fabric, you will see uh, what's used later on for the back diel, right at the back at the bottom. You will see kind of vague here in the picture, lines going horizontally. They are a metallic thread that is used to brocade the fabric. And that is an extremely historic old style that actually uh, was uh, still used in the 12th and 13th century in the Arab world and spread to Al-Andalus in Spain. And there are a museum, a textile 
pieces in museums in Spain, and, and one of them was brought over to the Metropolitan Museum uh, years back, and highlighting the cut of the dress and the back of it all in brocaded. So this is a style that has survived from at least the 12th, 13th century till now in uh, very little the color time. looks better in real life. I mean, the color on our TV here, TV monitor, doesn't look as good, but uh, the people are going to have the chance to see it in person. And, so uh, here, here you have a dress that is cut in a, exactly the same way as dresses in Al Andalus for the uh, Arab uh, uh, rulers, etc. In the 12th and 13th century, it has not changed almost at all. Now, the embroidery, of course, is the famous uh, couching stitch from Bethlehem, which is done by hand. And just to, uh, uh, to show you the chess piece, you see embroidery all over the place, but if you looked at the back of it, you would see that it's made of uh, squares, a small square and a bigger square of, of different color silks. Why they decided to do that when you don't see it at all uh, is something I've wondered. There must be a special significance for using it, some kind of uh, maybe uh, hijab or, or uh, uh, protection. In any way, it, it's completely covered by uh, cross by couching stitch embroidery, and always in this pattern: four circles in the uh, uh, corners and the middle one in the center. And the middle one very often has a cross in there, and it the whole pattern is very much like an icon, like the gospel books in the Eastern churches all over the Middle East. There's always this four. Uh, uh, St. Luke, St. Mark, St. John, the, the, the followers of Christ, and in the middle, a symbol of Christ. So I think that basically originated from Christian symbolism and later on became used all over Palestine, not knowing that it's used by a respective religion. Now, Anand. Anand. yes. <clears throat> Go ahead, Faisal. Uh, just a the hit, I know the history of this dress because it was donated by one of my sisters. She bought it in Amman in, 19, in 1965 from a Palestinian woman who was, uh, got it from the West Bank. And, uh, but, but she was living in Amman at the time. She was very el was el elderly. So who knows how old this dress is? is this it? is basically probably early 20th century because mm -hmm. of the heavy embroidery. In the end of the 19th century, the embroidery was lesser because of the economic conditions around. There were, uh, you know, very difficult times, and then before World War One, etc. And after World War One, and between the two world wars, there was a flourishing of uh, the economy because of trade and uh, trade with uh, all over the world. Some, especially from Bethlehem, they would uh, go to the South America, to the Americas. And in Jaffa, for example, the, the oranges. So you see the embroidery becoming a lot heavier. And, and this is early 20th century. Uh, and then I wonder, yes. go, I wonder go ahead, if you Krista. could. Yeah, I just have a question. I, I'm familiar with the distinctive uh, uh, style of Tatris in Bethlehem area. I, I saw an exhibit once uh, at the Palestine Museum in Ramallah. And I wanted to know if you could describe for our viewers how the technique is different from the other cross. traditional cross stitch tatris in other areas because it is so unique and so elaborate in its in, in, in the way only, the way these dresses are made absolutely it's also more difficult to execute than the cross yes the cross stitch can be done by younger uh, girls and they train and, and all over pa uh, palestine uh, cross stitch is the most popular only in this area it started and mm -hmm. then spread to other areas is the couching stitch. It was usually done by um, at workshops. Basically, the workshop is one lady who's well experienced with it, training a few uh, younger girls, so three, four girls. I mean, we're not talking big workshops. And they would produce everything by hand, and, uh, and they would sell it whenever a bride was coming to put together her uh, trousseau. So basically, what you do is you take a, a thick thread, and in the older times, it might have been metallic thread, meaning it would be silk that is covered with the meta metallic. So it's a heavy thread. You put it on top of the fabric, and then with a the fine thread and needle, you, you sew it onto the fabric and, and curving it, twisting, and 
creating all these uh, patterns. So it, it's quite a, a difficult technique to do. And to this day, there aren't that many, even in Bethlehem, to this day, a few, few ladies still do it and do it well. And the more so dense it is, the, the better quality. So and it has such a three-dimensional quality to it. If you can it, see it in person, it's just absolutely incredible. Yeah. So, and, and the thread, the metallic thread, had to be imported from uh, Ottoman times in Turkey mm -hmm. and or other places. And so it was quite an expensive thing to produce. You will also Hanan, notice, yes. Hanan, could you uh, talk about the significance of the motif on the sleeve? Yes, that's uh, what, what I want to take basically. All over Palestine, and, and I noticed that as I started my research uh, you know, decades ago, I, I was wondering whether is there any difference between Palestinians are mostly uh, Muslim and Christian, and is there a difference in the dress? And there isn't. The regional identity is what identifies them. In Bethlehem, everybody wore the same dress with a difference. For example, the Christian lady would have crosses on her dress. The Muslim lady would have uh, maybe a crescent or flowers instead where the cross would be. But the rest of the style is exactly the same. The habits were the same. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, that's one thing about it. Now, the other thing is uh, they always used to like to use uh, either birds or uh, what they call peacock. On top of the chess piece, there is uh, two, two peacocks, they call them. There were a lot of birds, in, and, and here it was the opulence and happiness and good health, the wishes for, for a happy life, basically. Um, the other thing is amazing to me always. The sleeves are always uh, done on, in the middle, the silk fabric is, is dark red, and the edges, the sides are orange. On the sides of the dress, the benaya, it's green with red, and this is a rule that's followed all the time. And, I'm saying it to, to to point out the the, the chess piece had all these squares at the bottom. Uh, there are rules that they followed that must have had meaning, and and some of the meaning has been lost. I, I tried hard to find out why these squares are, and everybody gives you a different explanation, which you know, which means they probably are guessing. Go ahead. Next, please. If it. Uh, highlight, could we highlight the back here? Maybe you can see the back of the dress. Face out. Here is what is called the sa'a, which is watch. Uh, they call it that because it resembles a watch, but uh, the pattern itself is much older than watches and uh, it was simply renamed in a modern way. Okay, here is the uh, Ramallah dress. Now, Ramallah usually it started off in the 19th century without any couching at all. It was all done in cross stitch like this black dress, beautiful, usually silk thread over uh, black linen. And uh, this would be the black Ramallah dress. With time, with interaction with Bethlehem and Bethlehem becoming so popular, uh, the couching stitch, they would also buy pre-embroidered uh, sleeves and put them on and as a kind of status symbol here. So you have the sleeves done, embroidered in workshops in Bethlehem and added to the Ramallah dress. And the reason you know this is Ramallah dress, you, be, you can barely see it, but if you look at the bottom back, the very bottom of the dress has the uh, tall palms pattern, which is typical for Ramallah. Now, Elbiri people wanting to be different from Ramallah have very similar dresses, but the torn palms are missing and there is like a T-shaped pattern. This part. Yeah. It's very condensed, but it is basically like the stalk of a palm tree. And it is, of course, the dress is done, cut exactly like the Bethlehem, like all other Palestinian dresses. And that, it, to me, really sounds, uh, the same cut has survived for so many centuries and not changed till the 20th century. Next, please. Okay, now these 
the, the Bethlehem, the Ramallah, and this one is called Jannu Nar, are some of the very best Palestinian dresses uh, you would have in a collection. And this is done, it can be worn in uh, several towns actually, Khalil, uh, Bethlehem, uh, uh, Lifta. It, it was a popular dress that uh, was worn, prepared one of several styles, up to eight styles around the Jerusalem uh, area villages. This is Jannunar, uh, meaning red and uh, uh, green. And the green is the Shanni, and the red is the Nar. And it's the name of a wedding dress. And, <laughs> and I find it humorous that uh, the wedding would be Jannunar. It's very uh, expressive. Trans translate for our audience. <laughs> <laughs> so, this dress originally would have almost no embroidery at all, maybe a very simple chess piece at the beginning in the 19th century. As time progressed into the 20th century, you start seeing uh, these heavy embroidered couching stitch, uh, handmade em embroidered from uh, in workshops and brought over, and the side uh, benay also. The patterns are totally different on this benay from what a Bethlehem dress would be like. So uh, here are the sleeves, the, and so it's become a very, uh, instead of the simple dress, it started as now one of the most festive ones. Han and Hanan, when, when you say Jannu yeah. Nar, can we translate that as, oh, I'm as sorry, I didn't translate. paradise, paradise <laughs> and fire? <laughs> when, when you're getting married, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> and and the, it's all made out of strips. The width of these strips are, are it. You would buy fabric uh, silk that is only this wide and make out of these strips uh, the dress. Next, please. Hanan, you made a point earlier that these these patterns and the cut and everything, you know, is virtually unchanged over centuries. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's just such an important point to stress, yeah. is particularly in this time when uh, there's so much, uh, we have a culture of denial right now about Palestine, Palestinians, Palestinian culture. And so it just really shows the continuity of, of the culture and the connection to the land uh, was over centuries. So happy when uh, there were many Palestinians who fought to have UNESCO uh, recognize it as a heritage, um, a very important thing, because it's really uh, the the, it's like an archaeological find, basically. Mm -hmm. These the data that have been conserved throughout over centuries have a meaning that uh, you can't refute it. It's it's so common, it's so spread out in Palestinian culture that it's not just a one occurrence. It's like every dress has this authenticity of history around it. And it wasn't changed. And how did they never change it? You know, women usually like to change, but basically the secret is this. This is a badge of identity. It's not fashion. It never was intended to be fashion. This was a, your badge of identity, and you don't change it because it's so important to keep to the tribe, to the place, to the region, etc. And and the region was so important that even your religion wasn't a barrier. It was the same, mm -hmm. uh, same identity badge. Now, here is a, a more recent dress. This is from probably early 1940s, just before the Nakba. And uh, this is from an area that's quite uh, warm in Palestine. It's the coastal area around uh, Lod and uh, Yaffa. And the dress is, uh, is appropriate for that. It's a cotton, it's light, and it's, uh, it's not as bulky and not as uh, heavy in the and what it and, and by that time they were also sewing everything by machines, single machines. There would be a lady who had owned the machine, you'd go pay her to sew your dress. Whereas three, four dresses that you saw before them, that the older ones, almost always they're sewn by hand, even not just you know, uh, embroidered by hand, but sewn by hand. Plus, of course, the fabrics would have been hand woven. Here it's hand, it's it's a machine. Uh, uh, fabric, and, and machine woven fabric, and the embroidery is extremely uh, unique to that area with the unusual uh, uh, chest piece uh, neckline square. So uh, the back of it has embroidery just as much. And, and by the way, all the lady wearing it would have a scarf over that would hide the back of the dress completely and the top. So the yoke is usually gorgeously embroidered here with two uh, um, roosters, 
very pretty, but nobody sees it because it's usually covered, uh, only at home. And I always find that, you know, that's the, the pride in, in the lady who's embroidering her dress. She didn't care, nobody saw it. She wanted the dress to be pretty and, and embroidered. So here is old uh, machine stitching, as you can see. And the, uh, the thread by that point are DMC cotton imported from uh, France and used throughout. And here, the, 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 on top of these lines, the roosters. The roosters were written in some embroidery pieces, actually, in, in books that these were copies from French and uh, European styles. It's not correct. What I put in the book, basically, is that uh, from uh, the, the, there's a museum in uh, Ashmolean Museum in London that has very old textiles from the Mamluk era. And in, during the Mamluk era, all their dresses were cross-stitch embroidery and a lot of uh, birds all over. So the birds motif from the 12th, 13th century in the Middle East. Next, please. So this is the same area. Sarafan is the, uh, the, the name of the town of the white dress, which is right around Ludd and Ramley. There's a very big uh, prison right now, actually. So, but here is another Sarafan dress that's dark. And that's usually very, even rarer and, and uh, quite important. Till I started looking close up and I realized what was done here. But very often, uh, say a daughter would take her mother's dress, cut off the embroidered pieces if the dress was worn, and put them on new fabric. And this was what's done here. If you see those uh, uh, lines of embroidery going down, to the bottom, uh, you'll see it's it's a fabric that's been put on top of another new fabric. So is the chest piece. It's a piece that was taken from another dress and put on. In this area, very often the embroidery was embroidered right on the fabric, not on a separate piece. Whereas in Ramallah, it's always embroidered on a chest piece and then added to the dress. So this dress was reconstructed from a, a previous uh, dress. And of course, doesn't have as the same value. Once you, uh, like all antiques, once you play around with anything, you start losing the value. But uh, the style is correct. This is the uh, black seraphim dress around uh, Ramli Lid uh, Yafa. Next, please. That incredible detail at the bottom of the dress on what you just were showing is just. Yes. And, and now here, here is um, uh, what you would, at first glance, you'd say Ramallah, you know, red on white, you know, but actually it's not. If you look at the back of the dress, at the bottom and of the back, all the way to the bottom, you will see that this pattern is not the uh, tall palms of Ramallah. So this is a Biri dress, or it could be uh, maybe, you know, closer to Jerusalem. Uh, this whole area started changing a lot in, in how they embroidered the dresses after 1948 because a lot of refugees came from uh, other areas and, and uh, stayed in the uh, West Bank Park under Arab rule. So there was a mixing of styles from uh, all different towns. And that's when the uh, what is called the Jerusalem six-line dress uh, was generated. It's a chess piece in the, all the Jerusalem uh, area region not Jerusalem itself specifically, but a lot of the towns and villages around it. One big chess piece embroidered and then uh, three lines in front and three lines in the back. So six lines of embroidery going down all the way to the bottom. And that became like the more standard Palestinian dress in the 1960s and 70s. And uh, the patterns were very often copied from other pattern books like this bird is a fancier pattern than would usually have been in uh, Palestinian dresses earlier on. But the style is still very much authentic and it's still, this hasn't played, been played around with the chess piece with the V inverted uh, arch of, uh, you know, symbolic, the patterns are, are all, this is a, a good dress of the era and machine stitched. The fabric is, uh, can't be counted. You, so they would put uh, the waste uh, canvas technique. You put canvas on top of the fabric, embroidered, 
and then remove the fat of the canvas, which is a two process. It's doubling the work, basically. Can you, Hanan, can you explain that? Because I have seen that. What What is the reason for that? Because the, you, uh, what you used the, to- The fabric do, wasn't it, stiff enough. Is that is that it? The, in the 19th century, early 20th century, the weave was a very simple weave. The thread mm -hmm. was thick linen, so you could easily count two threads mm -hmm. and two threads for the cross. Sure. Whereas here, it's finely woven by mm -hmm. machine, and you can't count. Either you okay. go estimating and it comes out messy, or you yeah. put a canvas work which has it, the grid is there and you right you know, so you can count the lines mm -hmm. but it's made into waste canvas meaning you can remove it easily it's easy to remove it's not the regular canvas that's strong sure so and that's done by all the bedouin dresses uh, also any area where they started using woven fabric they had to use that technique and next please Now, from that same area, this in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and here in the United States too, uh, there was a lady in Patterson who, young woman with a few kids, and she would sit and embroider all her clothes. So they would start uh, the embroidery with DMC fabric, a DMC thread uh, on uh, maybe synthetics, sometimes tergal and all these others, because it's easier to wash. The thread here is DMC, which is the variegated, I think they call it, uh, of the thread itself starts from light brown to dark brown so that it produces a uh, uh, change in color where you don't have to keep changing thread so it's faster. And the ladies would embroider it almost all over. You know, some of it is traditional or the chest piece, but the rest is the sleeves have all the uh, saro pattern, which is not traditional on this dress. So they changed it basically from the, the traditional to this kind of modern dress. So the Palestinian dress started from that point onwards, people feeling like they can do whatever they feel like they want to do. And and I think they started losing some of the uh, character. Because if you're not using the fabric that's of, uh, of traditional, if you're not using the uh, pattern that's traditional, and not the colors that are traditional, you can't keep saying that this is Palestinian embroidery. Just because a Palestinian lady embroidered it doesn't make it Palestinian style. So I think I would encourage people who do embroidery to try to stick to some form of authenticity to, to keep the, the style and the history going. Because this is not fashion. If you think of this is the opposite of traditional dress is the opposite of fashion. It it's supposed to be something that doesn't change in your identity whereas fashion will change with seasons so and that's when you start losing your without realizing it you, you're losing your uh, history next please and then can you talk a little bit about about you know over time who would be doing this embroidering and you know was it primarily for your own dress or yeah. Just talk a little bit about how that evolved over time. Well, up to the 19th century and early 20th century, it was basically every person, every young bride with her immediate family, mother, aunts, uh, sisters, would help her produce a, a wardrobe uh, for the wedding. The wedding would be, uh, they'd have up three up to eight dresses is all that she would have because they were all basically the same style, maybe a little bit uh, fancier, a little bit less, one for the day, one for the evening. Mm -hmm. They worked in embroidered dresses. There's pictures of people in the field with an embroidered dress. So it's not like this was only for weddings. That's what they wore all the time. And sure. if it was all dress that from their mothers, they would wear it out. Or, and the reason we can't find too many dresses from the 17th century, etc., 18th century, is because everything was recycled. Anything that's embroidered was recycled, either into another dress or on fresh fabric or a child's dress or pillows. Or, and you can see it in our collection. There's dresses that have uh, the dresses, uh, fabric is navy, and then part of it is uh, on green fabric. And it was obviously another piece from another dress. So that's one of the reasons why we can't find enough of the old dresses. Well, and like you said, women wore the dresses. Like even today, yes. you go to oh, the old market in Jerusalem or anywhere, and women are sitting there 
on the stone and, and sell and it in Egypt, it. Or, yeah. or whatever. <laughs> they, they take fabric that's quite strong, the linen, tough linen, and later on the strong uh, synthetics. And, and the dress was strong and, and it was supposed to almost like a, a carpet in a way. And underneath it, they'd be wearing another simple slip dress so mm -hmm. that when they sat on uh, on the side of the road or something, they'd put, pull, pull the embroidery up and, and yeah, set to it. protect it. <laughs> That's right. So what happened was everybody did their own embroidery. Then in, in Bethlehem, they started the workshops. They would sell the embroidery to the bride. Mm -hmm. And then later on, the, the workshops, right after 1948, the night week, a lot of women needed a form of income, and this was a cottage industry that started in Jerusalem, in Ramallah, all over the Arab world, the Amman, etc. They would organize these workshops to embroider something they could do at home while they're watching the kids, etc. So then they started the workshops, and, lay, and that grew into quite a large uh, effort, by uh, mostly led by women, organized by women in, in, uh, all over the Middle East, Palestinian women doing embroidery for sale, uh, pillows, shawls, etc., as a source of uh, income. So that's when the, the, the embroidery on their own dresses became less and less. Now let, let, let's stick with the, the other dress, please. Let's stick with that. Okay, so this one is a, a Bedouin dress from the Naqab. This is from mm -hmm. uh, 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 Bir Saber. The, the neckline is unusually open, a V neckline usually. It's not typical, usually it's a closed neckline, but this is authentic, I looked at it. It's embroidered around the edges, which means that it wasn't done by a dealer because uh, it's not worth his time and effort to have somebody embroider. It's somebody herself who decided they wanted to do that. But the dress is authentic, beautifully embroidered all over, red being the, the, the color that uh, young brides would uh, do their uh, dresses and their clothes. The blue dresses would be more like the older, uh, the older women widows. So this dress is well well done from front and back, and typical. And it's cotton that's machine uh, uh, woven, imported usually, and embroidered with cotton thread that's DMC or other uh, cotton thread. Next, please. Here is another Bedouin dress uh, from more uh, the Gaza area. And uh, here is, the, and the patterns are authentic and, and interesting in the back around the shoulders. They brought in an old pattern that was seen in the 19th century and kind of disappeared. And here they do that V around the back again, uh, which is authentic uh, to that area. Some dresses in the, in the Gaza area would have that V in front and in the back in the 19th century. Faisal, can you shift the image to see the back? Uh, you're not seeing the back now? No, we're just seeing the front panel and the bottom. Just uh, shift it. This this V is what I'm... Uh, it, it has the look of... Oh, what's like called shifted the, like this. oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's my fault. My screen is, is shifted. Okay, I see it. <laughs> this is the necklace pattern that it's called. Yeah, beautiful. Next. So we can, we can zoom in. So Hanan, Hanan, I find this pattern very different, honestly, than some of the yes. other traditional patterns I've seen, right. uh, especially at the bottom there. Can you yes. talk about that a little bit? The bottom of the V? No, the bottom of the dress at the, at oh. the yeah, with, with uh, it, you know, and actually along the sleeves too, there's almost like these, you know, it's blocks of, of, of embroidery, very yes. if, if colorful can... and... These, these patterns are, uh, it's hard to figure out what they were before. They kept getting copied and copied and the, the sure. was lost. But there's also, if, if you could scroll down, please, uh, to the bottom of the back, the gel. Yeah. It's all, it's all in kind of uh, almost square. Uh, right, yeah. Dress. I think it's what, here. What it used to be before that was they would have a, a grid a pattern and uh, embroidery in between. And that's found in carpets that are very old from the area. And it's sure. Mamluk times, they actually had the patterns in the book. I put uh, some textiles from Mamluk times. These patterns have, have been in the Middle East and used extensively from the 
12th, 13th, 18th, uh, even Fatimid times uh, in the ninth century before. Uh, with copying, they kind of lost uh, some of their detail, but they're old patterns. Next. Fascinating. Okay, so here in the dress, I almost uh, took it out of there with the talking to Faisal, but then decided to leave it. Here is a Bedouin dress from uh, Bir Saba, blue. It's kind of rare. Blue dresses are very popular. Everybody wanted blue. Uh, we had a friend who wanted to buy every single blue dress he could. But somebody got it and decided that it was very not flattering. It, it, when you put these toes on, you look like you're 20 pounds more than you are. So they kind of narrowed it around the waist and made it fitted. And in the meantime, lost all its value, basically, as a traditional dress. Now it's mm. a fashion item and, you know, you can wear it fine, but it's not a historical. You lost the very important uh, cut of the dress that is part of the dress. Next, please. Now, here is what happened with time. This is probably from the 70s, 80s. The uh, couching stitch was becoming very difficult to uh, to get from workshops, very expensive. So in around Jerusalem, they started doing these dresses that were part machine embroider, part uh, probably a little bit of hand embroider. But when I say machine embroider, basically, the fabric is velveteen, and a, a lady sits with a sewing machine and directs the embroidery of the machine. So it's, I, I don't call that machine embroidery, it's kind of handheld machine embroidery or something. But this is what they created to make it uh, uh, financially feasible for them. And in the meantime, to me, it destroyed all of the beauty of the Bethlehem, gorgeous Bethlehem uh, Melek dress. You know, the embroidery, the colors, the patterns even are, are changed to something that's similar, but not. I'm wondering if uh, whoever was doing the pattern would even know what the name of the pattern was that they were calling, you know. So this is the kind of modernity that to me, it's not appealing. If you want to modernize, I think it should be done as authentically as possible, maybe with less embroidery, but keep the keep the real spirit of the and, and the meaning of the patterns. Next, please. And here is another dress that was uh, from the Gaza area, the famous Mejdal fabric, which is from uh, green stripe to uh, turquoise stripe, I guess, to pink stripe. That's the width of the fabric and uh, made into a dress around the Gaza area. But that must, this is a fairly recent, the patterns are totally not uh, ancient. They're copied from pattern books that are not Palestinian. So the flowers and all that, that's when people started wanting to change and do things their own way. So the fabric is very valuable. A dress without any embroidery like that is already uh, important because of the fabric, but uh, the pattern is something modern, different. Next. Next, please. And here is what happened, uh, for example, in Beirut, in Amman, in Gaza, and Egypt. Uh, Palestinian ladies and, and other uh, ladies wanted to produce pieces that were embroidered Palestinian embroidery, traditional, but uh, applicable to modern times, which, which can be worn in special occasions. So some of these dresses in, uh, uh, in Beirut were produced by Al and, and, and uh, from Shantum silk. We have you in our collection and, and uh, embroidered beautifully with very good cross stitch, with the waist technique, of course, on silk you couldn't count. And uh, this is a lady from Gaza here who uh, actually had, she designed her own dress and asked the workshop to produce it for her in Gaza. So this would have been a prized item, one to wear to weddings on the best occasions. A modern, probably uh, 80s, 90s, and, and later on. Uh, yeah, I you. see that has a, a zipper up the back even. Yes. So it is yes, very, is very, very different. All the modern conveniences, the cut is not sure. the same, but the pattern. Right. It's, yeah, it's a tighter it cut, which is why you need the zipper, because otherwise, you normally you just put it over your head. And at that time is when they introduced the fabrics in all different colors, 
this was never a, a yellow color embroidery. It would be sure. Palestinian embroidery. And also the tighter sleeve, you know. Yes. Which is not traditional. And the fitting. Mm -hmm. so, well, well, the tight sleeve could be, you know, the, the Jaffa area yeah. is tight mm -hmm. sleeve. But uh, it, it's the fitting it to make you look that uh, nicer. So right, you see the you see the darts in the fabric sewn vertically down. Basically, what what I, I I mean I have fabrics and I have stuff that's modern that's done not traditionally that I wear because I like to have the embroidery on. But I sure. I count this as fashion, not as traditional. Mm. So that's where we should dis, you know uh, uh, differentiate basically when we start to innovate. And here is uh, the last dress is basically uh, totally fashion. The, the top is embroidery taken from another dress. The bottom is all, the blue is all cross-stitch embroidery. It's uh, tallest, they call it. It's completely embroidered with uh, cross-stitch. And then over it, somebody decided to make a pattern of, with sequins. And interestingly, the pattern they chose is uh, what, uh, what was used to be uh, on bins that were to store wheat or whatever, they would carve these kind of floral patterns. And that's the pattern that was. So here is a total creation that has to do with fashion. It has really very little to do with tradition other than the embroidery is uh, traditional. So here is the big dilemma for Palestinians now. How do you go from here, make totally different everything modern and say this is what we are now, or keep the, the beauty of the history that was kept, you know, that was honored by UNESCO, keep it alive one way or another. So uh, I leave that question to all of you to think about, and uh, I'm sure everybody has their own solution to that question. Thank you, Hanan. Um, I think uh, we, we really appreciate this very informative uh critique of these various uh, thobes uh, sure uh, beats that um, uh, antique roadshow by by quite a bit. <laughs> by the way, a lot of people were collecting only the old and now they realize that these dresses are historical. You have to collect whatever is being produced to document what's happening. So all of your dresses have their place in documentation, basically. Yeah. So uh, we're gonna move on to uh, the, the next uh, phase of this, and we will now hear uh, from Rima Annam. Uh, Rima, are you with us? Please come on up here. And uh, uh, Rima is an artist who uh, ha who is exhibiting a number of paintings that feature embroidery uh, items and, and figures, um, and uh, we. She also brought with her four Palestinian authentic thobes that she will, will tell us about uh, first. And then after that, we will look at the artwork that's uh, already on the walls here as part uh, of the exhibit. So uh, just we, we need a moment to move the camera. And I'm asking Amin, and her son, who came along, to bring the Please. other two mannequins uh, <laughs> so that we have the four dresses all in one place. Thank you, Amin. <laughs> So stand by while we just shift to this next uh, this next part of the program. Thank you so much, Hanan, for that really informative uh, presentation. And I did put the title of your book in the chat. I will do that again for those of you who you know sometimes things get buried in the chat. Um, and you can let our audience know your preferred way of them ordering that. Actually, uh, through Resell, uh, through the museum. Through the museum, okay, available through the museum. Or the publish well, internet. Right, or well, I, I, I will get the, the link for our audience to make it extra simple so that you can um, click on the link to the shop and get right to the to that book. Give me so just we're gonna do here. some tricky stuff now. So we're gonna mute. So there's that link for you. And what an incredible cover on the book with the uh, 
with the couching stitch that you yeah. described. Yeah. It's just it's stunning. And the jackets. Can you hear me? Oh, there there's some here. echo. There's echo, Faisal. So okay. you might need okay. to make okay. some okay. adjustments. Make It's muted already. Uh, there's a very severe echo. So I think you gotta close either one or the other. I, I mean, mute, mute one uh, view or the other. Testing. The Testing. Testing. Huh. We still have a, a, a really strong echo. I'm not sure what you need to do to fix that, but that would be helpful if you could find out. Let's see. And uh, just talk loud. Yes. Okay. Look at the camera here. I will. Uh, what's that, uh, Krista? Can you hear uh, Rima? Yeah, n yeah. Now I can hear. I can hear you now. Yes. Yeah, Rima. Yeah. How about me? Re can you yes, I can hear you. I can hear you, Rima. Yeah. And you see the video. Uh, we have a view of the four dresses on mannequins. I see Rima, and oh, right. the the other view is is you know has the background of the Venice exhibit. So. I'm, so you may want to turn off the background of the Venice exhibit because otherwise uh, Rima is fading in and out um, since she's not right in the camera view. We will uh, pin Rima, so we'll go up the screen. We can get yeah, maybe uh, maybe get rid of the background on the screen that you're on now because it's it's distorted hold, otherwise. Hold on a second. Um. And Rima, I hope you start by telling us about that amazing dress that you're wearing. <laughs> How is that? Better? Uh, well, I mean, we see the background of the Venice exhibit. And it's so you're way up on top. No, no, it's there on the screen where you're looking close up. It's still the Venice exhibit as the background. So the, the, the shot where it's further away, where we see the four dresses on the mannequins, that one's fine. But the one, okay, now now you've got rid of the background. Now we can see you. Now you can see all the dresses. I see the dresses and now we also have the view of the room. Well, I brought along the other dresses and I from my personal connection. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt, Rima. You're going to have to decide to talk into one of the microphones. Otherwise, our people on Zoom will not hear you. Okay. There we go. Now we can see your face. So I'm assuming we'll also hear your voice. <laughs> well, I have brought my personal collection of dresses. These are family dresses of the Ganam family, or I should say, Ranam family. Uh, that comes from Dadabran. Palestine near Ramallah. These were all dresses that were made by relatives. And uh, as Anand so nicely spoke about different embroideries, this is one of the dresses that was actually made and worn by my sister-in-law. And uh, it is a silk fabric. And it is done in the Palestinian style, the design with the triangle and the front piece. But embroidery looks quite a bit European. And it's an unusual pattern because it has a floral pattern. But it's a very beautiful dress. And uh, I was impressed when I came to Palestine the first time and I saw women coming to visit us and they were walking through the street towards our house. The wind was blowing, their veils were flying in the wind, and they were all wearing these beautiful, colorful dresses. And I was so impressed by it, and it was burned into my memory. 
and mm -hmm. I decided that I would uh, preserve the dresses and preserve what I have seen there. And I'm an artist and uh, originally a fashion illustrator. And of course, I was fascinated by these beautiful patterns and these beautiful dresses. And I decided that I would do my sketches and paintings. And this is what I've been doing. But I want to now speak about the dresses. This dress was also done by a sister-in-law. And this is a traditional, the red and white dress, is a traditional Palestinian pattern. And it has a beautiful floral pattern down the front. And I you can see the back right now. And also this dress, very, I find it very unusual because the other one is in the Jerusalem and Ramallah area where they prefer to use this, the cross stitch, stitch embroidery. This is done actually in the couching stitch, which is very popular in Bethlehem. And it's where the thread is kind of round around and it's stitched on with tiny, tiny stitches in order to hold it in position. And this was done most likely in the 1970s because at that time there were a lot of people coming from different regions into the Ramallah area to uh, live in or to settle in, in the refugee camps. So the styles were kind of interchanged. People adopted the styles from a different region of Palestine. This dress is a dress that was gifted to me by a lady who was a professor at Harvard University. And this is a Bedouin dress from the desert. And I included this dress today because, number one, the embroidery is very beautiful. The pattern is a traditional Palestinian pattern, but this dress is totally stitched by hand. Everything is stitched by hand. There's not one machine stitch on it. And the most interesting part of this dress was how clever these women were. This is a woman who embroidered this dress, and she lived in an area where there was not much access to different material, and they used patches of material in order from, from old dresses, old cotton dresses, and they used these fabrics in order to stabilize them the original embroidery. And a very clever aspect of this is, in a, it's a very modern aspect. I don't have any idea how old this dress is, but they took apart a zipper and stitched a zipper to the back of the dress in order to protect the embroidery on it. And I thought this was very clever. And uh, it shows how inventive these women were when they were doing these dresses. Now, of course, this kind of embroidery takes a lot of expertise to do it. It's very fine stitching, but it was done over a period of time. Women would sit down and do these embroideries and sew and embroider their own dresses. Now, a lot of the dresses are embroidered by professional artists and professional embroiderers. Uh, the reason why these dresses are very important to me is, first of all, because these were family pieces, and I know exactly who made them and when they approximately were made and who wore those dresses. Uh, on a subsequent trip to Palestine, I saw that most of the women were not wearing these dresses anymore, perhaps some of the old ladies to special occasions, and I felt very saddened by it because I saw that an important part of the Palestinian heritage was being lost. New girls, young girls would not really learn how to do this anymore. Only the older women knew how to do this kind of stitching. And um, the original dress that was part of the Palestinian identity was not that often worn anymore, only to special occasions. And instead, a lot of women adopted the Islamic dress. 
I do respect their choice of Islamic dress, but I also felt that part of the Palestinian heritage and Palestinian culture is embedded in these kind of dresses. And uh, I felt very sad. And at that point, I decided that I would try to preserve not just the dresses, but also preserve them in my paintings. And I would show the women wearing those dresses or making a dress. And uh, this has kind of become my mission. And this is why I'm very pleased to be part of this exhibit. And uh, I thank Mr. Faisal Salah very much for the invitation. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here today. And I'm wearing a jacket, which is actually a modern version of Palestinian embroidery. This one was made in Amman. And uh, I feel it's something that I could wear even if I go to any kind of function in this country. And it would still be beautiful, not just because of the embroidery, but also because of the colors. Good. So. Uh... And, uh, I think we, we're going to continue uh, uh, with Rima. We're going to go look at uh, some of the artwork and uh, we're going to speed it up a little bit because I realize that we're taking up a little bit of time earlier. Faisal, Faisal, would you mind just before we start walking around, Rima, would you back up a little just so our Zoom audience can see the incredible detail on what you're wearing? We have some requests. <laughs> So maybe uh, someone can hold the camera so that we can see the detail of her dress, some of the panels. Um, you might want to lower the, the the camera just a bit. So we, I know it's it's a tricky thing because I know you're holding this the computer by hand, but yeah, just kind of go down a little so we can see some of that detail. Do you want to do a little spin around? So that's a jacket actually, pardon me. I have one of those. Those are just incredible. It's like the the modern, <laughs> the modern article of clothing with the traditional motifs and rich detail and patterns and color, of course. So it's just really stunning. Thank you so much for you want to do just turn around one so we can see the back. You know, sometimes it's just incredible how much um, embroidery is actually included on an article of clothing. Rima, you want to just turn around real quick? Just just spin around and face your face the mannequins so we can see the back of your jacket. There we go. And just lower the camera just a bit. So you can just see the the entire jacket has been uh, outfitted with this tatris. Okay, so here's where my are. background in fashion comes in. Yeah. You can wear something <laughs> plain, black, white. But something like this will liven it up and it will make sure. it sure. And now you can also see a little more of the detail on the mannequins as well, because we, we were only looking at the upper part of the dresses. But of course, the detail goes all the way to the bottom. I know it's for those of you on Zoom, I know we're not getting the full experience, but let's be patient with our technology. At least we're getting getting a glimpse of, of the idea of what we're looking at. Can you at. hear us? And yes, I can hear you quite well, yes. You can hear us, right? Yeah, so hopefully we won't get seasick here. We'll just, uh oh, um, Faisal, people are saying they can only see my screen, so. Make sure that we have it on gallery stop view. Talking. Or if you stop talking, they could see the other ones maybe. Can they see it now? Hold on. Any different? They're saying yes, I will go on mute. Okay. All right, so where do we start? Just, just go there and talk loud. Speak, speak loud, please. This is uh, More closer. This painting was done by me, and it reminds me of the view that I saw when I went to Jerusalem. There were women in front of the gate, the Damascus gate, and they were selling their produce, their mint, their radishes, their eggplants, and 
this was the inspiration for one of its one of my paintings. And as you can see, I'm standing embroidery on this dress. Okay, next. This is actually something that I took from a photograph. Get, get closer to us. And, and it is the amber necklace. And this is a Bedouin girl, and she's her embroidery may not be the traditional embroidery, but I focused on the whole outfit and I focused on that beautiful amber necklace that she was wearing. Okay, the wall. Just talk loud, please. This one. This one, Loud. this one was one of my paintings, and it's called Remembering Home. It shows a young woman in her traditional dress with somewhat thoughtful and sad expression, remembering the home that she left behind, perhaps in Jaffa, or in one of the other villages that were taken over. This one, this picture of a woman weaving, not wearing the traditional dress, but she had this. And this is actually an image of my mother-in-law who was weaving a rug and she's sewing it together. And I brought for this exhibit the rug that she was weaving and it's here on the floor. I don't know how old it is, but it is woven out of hand spun wool and it is sewn together out of two pieces because the looms that they were weaving on were very narrow looms because they were portable looms and it was stitched together in the middle with a very delicate stitch. And you will see it on the painting right behind you. Of course, this is not a picture of her, of my mother-in-law actually weaving it because she wove it perhaps, I would say, the rug may be at least 18, 90 years old. She wove it when she was a young woman. But this is artistic license and I- uh, What about this painting in the middle? This one? This one is one of my latest paintings because if you look around, you will see many of the paintings, they are kind of idealized uh, scenes of Palestinian mm -hmm. life and Palestinian costume. But I'm also faced with the reality of what is happening in Palestine now. And this painting is a mother with her two children. Where's the father? Perhaps the father is in prison in Israel, but it's a sad face. The child has a face that reflects the sadness of the family situation. So this is one of my later paintings that I just done recently, but again, it's a Palestinian mother with her dress. Okay, we got more on this, oh, this one. This you know, seeing when I showed the dress, that there was one dress, a white dress with red embroidery. This was the dress that inspired me to do this painting. Mm -hmm. Like so. Okay, we move to the next, next wall. Again, a mother and a child in the refugee camp, but she's wearing the traditional Palestinian dress. And the next. People are looking. You're still looking at it? Yes. Okay. Takes time. And this one is a young woman actually doing the embroidery mm -hmm. on one of the dresses that she with some family member will mm -hmm. wear at one time. Yeah, excellent. And uh, those are the samples that I bought for this exhibit this time. And uh, I uh, feel that by doing these kind of paintings, I'm also 
preserving some of the Palestinian heritage. And uh, Rima, uh, stay, stay, some, look at the camera here. Um, some people are asking if these are for sale or not. Actually, these are pieces that uh, my family wants to preserve, and uh, they are. So we're going to have to talk them into it. You, you have to talk to them about it. <laughs> Okay. Or, or, or Rima, have you considered making prints or maybe, of them that could be available uh, through the can, museum? Uh, maybe you can uh, authorize some prints that can be made from I, them. I, I can do that. So yes, we could talk to that. you about that. I can always make yeah. new paintings. Uh, but then they, would, they won't let you sell them. Uh, well, I, I think uh, uh, so, yeah. they have enough paintings. But there's one thing that I also wanted to show. I mean, would you please bring the uh, the other dress, the uh, best, you have best? There's one dress that I forgot to talk about, yeah. which is kind of an interesting. I lost, I lost the, the audio, the video. Hold on one second. Oh, never mind. It's here. Okay. There's one dress that I brought along this time. Yeah. At first, I thought I would wear the dress because it's an extremely mm -hmm. uh, well done dress. It comes yeah. from Bethlehem. And uh, the you interesting thing about this. This, this is a remote like this. All the other dresses were family okay. dresses, but this is done in the traditional uh, Bethlehem couching embroidery. And it was a very, it was worn by a Christian woman because in here is a cross. So, you know, it was a Christian dress and Bethlehem was predominantly a Christian town. The condition is not very good anymore, but this is actually hand-woven fabric, hand-woven linen, and it has silk insets, and again, very, very fine stitching and very, very fine embroidery. And also the back piece, Hanan might know what this is. This is special. I believe this fabric is brought from the Damascus, and it has gold threads in it. But the interesting thing is how this dress was acquired. Somebody in my neighborhood had was moving and had sale. And I was just curious about the house. And I went in and it turned out that this house belonged to an artist. And I saw this dress hanging. I bought a few household items and I bought a few tubes of paint and I saw this dress hanging there. So I said, but well, is this dress for sale? And they said, yes, it is. And uh, the gentleman I spoke to said, well, you mean the Japanese dress? And I did not want to seem too eager because I really, really wanted this dress. I did not want to seem too eager. So I said, yeah, I guess that's the one you're talking about. He said, okay, fine. I give it to you for a hundred dollars. I said, well, a hundred dollars, a little bit much. So how about you throw in all the household items that I bought and the tubes of paint and I'll give you $50. He said, okay. <laughs> and I took this dress home and this has become my prized position because according to uh, Hannah and Munea, this is about a hundred years old. It is all handmade and is very exquisite work. On this dress and I felt by buying this dress I'm preserving something. I basically rescued this dress because people did not know what they had at that time. So I am preserving something that is a piece of Palestinian culture that will always be priced and perhaps at one time if my family does not want to keep it it might go to a museum. Renata, Thank you. could I, can you hear me? I mean, can you help me with the other machine? No. Now, next we will be hearing from Tabia shortly as we uh, move the cameras and reconfigure for a different mode. Can you put it back in the video? Uh, while we're setting up the next uh, part, I will briefly introduce Tabia. I'm going to mute here. Uh, Faisal, I'm okay. just going to introduce her, okay? Quick while you're figuring out your technology, okay? So Tabia was born in 1995 in Vienna, Austria, and in 2018, she went to Palestine. 
where she made her first photo reportage about the occupied territories of Palestine. And after this trip, she decided to deal more intensively with photography. So in 2019, since 2019, she's been studying visual journalism and contemporary photography at the University of Applied Sciences and Arts in Hanover, Germany. And her work focuses on collaborative approaches. And in addition to her personal work, she deals a lot with the topic of being a woman in its various facets. So in just a moment, we'll get started with Tavia. We're so honored to have her on this week's hybrid program at the Palestine Museum. And uh, we'll just stand by and uh, feel free to say hello, Tavia, if you would like. Um, Go ahead and unmute. Yes, thank you so much for the nice introduction, Krista. And I think, Hanan, uh, you wanted to say something before I continue. I think you wanted to ask a question as I heard it. Oh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. OK. Um, the dress, the uh, left dress, uh oh, Hanan, wait one moment. We have a little bit of audio distortion, I think, uh, due to them setting up the area. Faisal, if you can mute the screen that you're on so that we can. I'm going to just give me a second. Okay. Let, let's just wait till he mutes. Otherwise, we're going to have distortion and getting it's hard a phone to hear. call. <laughs> uh, I mean, could you come here a sec? So just stand by for just a moment here. Uh, if you can just. Oh, oh, there it is. There we go. OK, Hanan, go ahead. Yeah, yes, the Bethlehem dress, the last one that uh, uh, Rima Ranata showed, is a, a really very, very special uh, example. It has very little embroidery on the sleeves, if you notice, and on the sides, which dates it basically earlier than most of the other heavily embroidered uh, probably late 18th century or very early 20th century. Whereas the, the one that is in the museum that Faisal has is uh, was heavily embroidered on the sleeves and on the benai, you know, that's probably more in the 1920s, 30s or, or later. So, uh, so the older dresses, which are usually the lesser embroidered, to me historically are so much more important because they show the continuity and the progression into one stage to the other. So it's a very special dress. The problem with this fabric is that it tends to start uh, breaking up uh, in, in lines going down and the uh, museums uh, are taking uh, special precautions to pad them and, and uh, preserve them. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Anna. in those, in those, yeah. Go ahead, Tavia. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Like, if, if you want to say something, just continue, and then I'm going to talk. No, I was. No, it's fine. We we can keep moving here because we we have some some great pieces to see now from from your artistic endeavors. So, take us take us through them. Good, good. So, good afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you are on the world, <laughs> and to everyone, and thank you again for having me and I'm really, really happy to be part of this event and this exhibition with my photography. So I'm just going to use the next couple of minutes to talk um, about my connection to Palestine. And I'm also going to talk about my documentary project 48 Stitches. So as Krista um, already mentioned, um, my first time in Palestine was in 2018. And there I also started to make my first pictures about the life of the Palestinians um, living under the Israeli occupation. And after my return to Europe, uh, two things were clear for me. So the first thing that I definitely needed to return to Palestine. And the second thing is that if I return, I also really want to work with Palestinian people on the ground. So um, last year in 2022, I was working three months um, with an organization in Palestine. And there I also had the chance to do a photographic project with Palestinian women in Annabi Samwil and in Kalanya refugee camp, um, both communities which we have been working closely together. Maybe I'm just going to put a link to my homepage so that you can also see this work, um, because I think right now I can't share my screen if I, because I think if I'm going to share the screen, then the bigger picture will go away, right? Okay. Yes. So I'm going to put in the links later so that you can take a look if you want to. 
And so, um, yeah, back in Germany, I started to do some lectures about the situation of the Palestinian people. And at the beginning of this year, a group of Palestinian women who were living in Germany reached out to me with this beautiful idea of photographing themselves in their traditional Palestinian dresses, so in their thopes. And this was actually the beginning of the collaborative documentary project, 48 Stitches. So during the last couple of months, I started to make more portraits of Palestinian women living in the diaspora. And I also asked them to write down their experience and the stories on the paper. So I just want to wrote uh, to to um, tell you one quote from um, Farouz, which you can also see in the picture. So what Farouz wrote was, the dress I'm wearing belongs to my mother. She bought it in Jordan because she had never been to Palestine herself. My mother wears the dress for special occasions, such as Christmas or New Year's Eve. And when I wear my mother's taupe, I feel very connected to Palestine. I feel that my identity is confirmed. I am a real Palestinian. So today for Palestinian and I think especially for Palestinian living in the diaspora, bearing the topes is a form of preserving the culture, the heritage, the history, and also of course, a way of connecting to the homeland. And um, I think with the project 48 Stitches, uh, we really want to contribute to conserve the culture of the Palestinian woman through the photography and the text, and also in the same time, celebrate the culture. And I think I just wanna close my really quick talk uh, with another quote from Rahab, which you can also see in the picture. Actually, she's there in this picture of the free woman in the middle. This is Rahab. And what Rahab wrote down was that the taupe is a part of Palestinian culture and symbolizes in my eyes, the defense and resistance of the people. When I, a, when I wear my taupe, I feel stronger. When I wear it in exile, I forget the alienation. For the future, I wish that I carry my taupe in free Palestine. So that's it for my side. I know it was really quick, <laughs> but I think that's actually also what was demanded for my side. So if you have any questions, just, you know, please feel free to ask. Um, and I'm just going to put in um, the link to the project in the chat so that you can take a closer look. And yeah. Thank you. But before you tune out, uh, there are some people in our Zoom audience who are saying they're not able to see the pictures. So Faisal, are, are is they, there- Are they seeing it now? I mean, I, I see it, but I'm not sure. Uh, perhaps you need to be on gallery on. view. Uh, no, let me just do something here. Let me take a look or, or try speaker. Now, now. better. Kate, do you see, do you see the photos now? She says no, she cannot see them. And other people cannot either. Uh-oh, I had no idea. Um, okay, have him try now after I stop talking. Can anybody see them? No, still no. Hopefully we can fix that quickly so you get a glimpse. These are incredible photographs. And I just put in the link of the whole project in the chat. So there you can also see the pictures. I know it's um, maybe something else to see them live, but yeah. Is this any different? Now they can see. Okay, so just quickly do a scan of all of the images so that people can see them in real time. I think it's just an incredible combination of doing the photography with the stories from these women and all being in the diaspora talking about their connection to Palestine through these cultural artifacts, these fam family heirlooms.
Notice how we mounted some of the photos on the glass. No one, they still can't see the photos. I'm not sure why. Hmm. Is this better? So Bea, we mounted that straight up instead of sideways. I saw it. I got a little heart attack. <laughs> but it's fine. It, it, it looks is... it looks really great. Look at that. It, it's amazing. Yeah. It looks, I like it. looks like tape to the wall. <laughs> <laughs> it's also beautiful. It's the first time that I see the pictures all hanging together. So it's really nice to see. These are incredible dynamic photographs, really so much expression. Stunning. Thank you so much, Tavia, for sharing with us. You're welcome. And just one, because I just saw one question. So, of course, um, the text is of the woman on the link that I sent there in German. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just working right now to make a translation of the text so that you can also see them in English. But I think it's going to take some time because it's pretty hard to translate this really in a common sense with everybody. So, yeah. Uh, Tabia, by, by the way, I'm fluent in German. If you need any help, let me know. Oh, great. <laughs> Super. <laughs> I'm fluent in, in German and Palestinian culture together. So <laughs> a good combination. <laughs> Perfect combination. <laughs> Tabia, you notice how we mounted two of the two of the pictures on um, on the glass, on the glass window? Yes, I love it. It's beautiful. Look, yeah, you can see the outside behind them. Yeah. Slow, I mean slow. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, that's that's really beautiful, stunning. It's almost like the, the backdrop of the window is part of part of yeah. the part of the picture. When you walk yeah. in the room, that's the first thing you see in the back there. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah. And everybody can see them now, right? Okay, I have uh somebody with a raised hand here. Let's see. Um maybe two people have raised hands. Um so Layla, you can talk. She's my sister, actually. Layla. You need to unmute yourself and talk. If you raise your hands to talk. Okay, go ahead. We can't hear you. We cannot hear you, sorry. Okay, let's try. Dor Doris, do you want to speak? If you don't, lower your hand, please. Oh, okay, so Doris, uh, Doris, you can talk if you want. Unmute yourself. So Krista, I think uh, after this, in a moment, I, I will take the camera for the rest of the museum. Okay. And I'll I'll do a a quick tour of everything there. Okay, just bear Sounds with me. Sounds good. Uh, Amin is doing a good job showing the uh, this room, and uh, it... Hanan, uh, uh, make yourself at home if you like. You're welcome to stay. You if you uh, have some pressing things, um, do whatever is is, is necessary. Uh, I can't hear you. You're, you you need to unmute yourself. I want to thank you for a really interesting program and I'll keep following it, but my picture doesn't have to be there. If you want to pick it up, it's fine. Okay, I'll take your picture out. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to mute myself here. I'm going to, to do the tour now, okay? 
Krista, let me know how if, if, if something isn't right, okay? Sure, just make sure you don't go too quickly. Some people are saying it's going a little too fast, so just um, give a chance to, for us to see things. So yeah. this is, of course, Rima's work we've seen. All right, I'll, I mean, needs a break anyway. <laughs> So yes, I think it would be a great idea to see if Rima is willing to make some prints of her artwork that could be made available through the museum. We have requests in our chat. <laughs> and Tabia, I wonder if you could just mention also, tell us a little about your family and your connection to Palestine. while yes. we're walking through the museum. Yeah, of course. So um, as I said before, I'm originally from Vienna, from Austria. Mm -hmm. And so I don't have any Palestinian, um, uh, how to say, like like family in, in myself. So mm -hmm. my father is half Iranian, half Austrian, and my mother is half French, half German. So it's a little bit of a cultural mixture with us. Mm -hmm. And so I think basically the the whole motivation um, why I wanted to go to Palestine was because, you know, as maybe you know, Krista, but I don't know if anybody else know, but in Europe and especially in Germany and Austria, um, newspapers are really um, not, how to say it in a polite way, are not um, really um, uh, writing down the news in an objective way from the Middle East conflict. So for me, it was just really important to see it with my own eyes. And I think that this was the whole motivation to go there. And then I saw it and I, yeah, I just needed to return. So I think that's that's the whole story. It's funny how one experience like that can just completely change your life, right? Yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. It's super I, I had a, a similar experience. I, I was an, a student of international studies. I was studying in Germany at the time and had the opportunity to visit a family, a refugee family in Gaza and a Jewish family in Jerusalem. And it, the rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what did you study, Krista? Uh, well, I was, my undergrad was in international studies. Then I went oh. on to do my master's in Middle Eastern studies and uh, my doctorate in education. So Don't yeah, but you Palestine like became Don't part of my life. <laughs> you can't see the picture. Oh, well, it's you can. incredible, it's yes. Okay, Krista, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right. Uh, let me I'm gonna turn up my microphone, my speaker here too. You're loud right. and clear. Okay. So um, can you close the door? Uh, so in, in this room here, you're gonna see some uh, historic photographs from Palestine uh, before 1948. And uh, Okay, on the floor, we have one of these maps, the um, depopulation of Palestine, 1948 Nakba, and it's, uh, it's part of the animated map, but this is the, when the animation ends, you end up with this, with this map on the screen usually. Uh, there is a globe here, it's a Rand McNally globe from 1930 and it has Palestine on it. I can't zoom the camera to see it, but it's like right above Egypt there, it says Palestine on it. It has all I the colonial countries on it, okay? I have a globe like that as well. It's really quite precious. Yeah, this tapestry that you see is a, is a replica of a Ismail Shammut painting about women. There are three women uh, in the picture, this highlights the importance of Palestinian women in the movement. Uh, these are some of the dresses that you've seen uh, in the pictures. Uh, and here is the, the Palestinian embroidery that almost every Palestinian home mm -hmm. has one of those. It's in Arabic, it's all embroidered, it's very clear. This is one of the, one of the clearest samples uh, around. 
Arisna zen shabab zen shabab arisna antarab santarab sarisna arisna. And it goes on. Okay. Yeah, we have so, that same one hanging in my in law's uh, home, the original family home back in near Janine. All right. So, uh, is uh, one of those not so fine pieces of art, but people love this uh, painting. Uh, here uh, we have a very unique uh, uh, installation. It's called uh, Sweet 16. Uh, I, hmm. I think the, uh, it, it has a lot of different possible meaning. Below it, uh, there is something called Maftulia. It's a doll that is covered with maftul and painted in gold. <laughs> and of course, maftul is the traditional hand rolled. Yeah. Uh, it's like a like, kind of like served like, like couscous. couscous. Yeah. Yeah, but it's 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 grains of wheat, uh, like the the bourgeois covered with hand rolled flour with water and dried. Yeah. And this painting is by Faiz Al Hassani. Uh, it's called Farewell, and uh, it's a pretty sad, and uh, these are two uh, embroidery uh, paintings uh, depicting Palestinian traditional soaps by Maher Naji and Irina Naji. Uh, these are um, paintings by Sana Tahboub from uh, the West Bank. Uh, uh, that small painting there is by Halim Aziz. Uh, Ragda Zaytun has these paintings from the series it's called Waiting. Mm -hmm. um, then we have a series by George Wahbe of realistic paintings of the holy sites of Bethlehem there. You can see the Church of the Nativity in Jerusalem and the Church of Holy Sepulchre, etc. Uh, and I'm just going to scan through the paintings here without a lot of commentary because um, we, we don't want to keep people too long. It's already four o'clock and we have people have to get out of here because of the weather. Um, there are several galleries here. We're in one of the smaller galleries. And uh, uh, and you could see some uh, this is a, a very uh, distinct, distinctive uh, painting by uh, Leila Kawash uh, for um, a, a woman by the name of Randa Sehwel from Ramallah. And uh, she lent us lent this painting to the museum. That's she. This was painted when uh, when she was getting married uh, some like thirty some years ago. And uh, yes. as you look, you can see these uh, uh, mannequin ladies uh, nicely dressed and standing in front of each one of the galleries here. Uh, those bright orange pieces are by Samia Halabi, mm -hmm. uh, is the oud player, uh, Muhammad Hawajri from Gaza. And these two pieces are by uh, Suzanne Bushnak. Uh, she lives in Kuwait now. Down below here, you see on the right is my father's passport. Uh, I think we can lower this down so you can see it up close. All right, th this is the passport. And this is the, his ID card. I would get the camera straight on it. And in the middle one is called Hsab al Bayara, <laughs> the accounting of the Bayara, which is the, <laughs> the, the orchard. <laughs> orange, gro orange grove and banana groves. It says my father's handwritten book of accounts, his QuickBooks, if you will. Wow, that is a treasure. <laughs> uh, I think I messed up the screen here. Here we go. Uh, so we continue. Um, there's more embroidery. 
This here uh, is a gift from Abir Rafidi in California, beautiful framed embroidery piece. Um, that's Halima Aziz. Uh, Samar Husseini has these two beautiful uh, dresses that are multi, uh, made of multiple things. And uh, there are three D actually. The one on the right sticks out, sticks off the, mm -hmm. uh, the board there. Beautiful dresses, uh, some Palestinian stamps down here. Uh, more artwork. Uh, this is artwork of an embroidery piece. Uh, so it, it is it is painted, but it's it's beautifully uh, painted. Uh, it's made uh, by an artist in the UK. Her name is My Saloon. Um, these things were recently donated to the museum. Uh, they are some sort of a makeup uh, devices. And on each one has two reservoirs on each side. And those reservoirs hold kuhul, which <laughs> is the Palestinian uh, or Arabic eyeliner. So you would stick your uh, uh, stick in the hair and, and then you put on your eyes and use the mirror to, to put the makeup on. They're very old and historic. They're all embroidered, as you can, as you can see there. Incredible. <laughs> the one on top here is, oh. There's a, another piece of embroidery here, uh, provided to the museum uh, by Samira Sudki Abdullah. Uh, and uh, she very proudly donated it to the, to the museum. Uh, there's a, a great uh, painting on loan to the museum uh, by uh, Amal Rashid, uh, and it was painted by the late Palestinian artist uh, Muhammad Bushnak. Um, we have a whole bunch of things here. Um, this series of paintings by Muhammad Al Hajj from Gaza. Uh, it's called in Arabic intikal or trans transfer, transform it, or transition. It's, it, it highlights the uh, the plight of the immigrants and people who have been uh, expelled from their home. In the back, uh, the colorful pieces are by Namir Qasim, and here a painting of Jerusalem by Dalia Ali, uh, and a few other paintings there. Uh, Faisal, one... the coins, uh, Faisal, can you hear me? The coins on the mirrors, the makeup mirrors, someone's asking if they are Palestinian coins. No, they're not authentic. They're just yeah. decorative. Okay. Uh, here we have uh, uh, an installation. Uh, it's a kafia. It's, it's made out of 47 kafias tied together. They mm -hmm. form a bridge and it has a variety of meanings. Mm -hmm. One of the meanings is that uh, the unity of Palestine, 47 individual kafiyas become one bridge. Uh, uh, we have sculptures here by Sana Farah Bshara from uh, uh, Haifa. Uh, Ala al Baba here, the refugee camp, mm -hmm. colorized. Um, Zainab Shah an olive tree with a kafiya on it. Uh, Rassan Abu Laban, the village, abstract painting. Another uh, sculpture by Dana uh, Farahshara, beautiful one. It also moves. You can actually move it around like that. Oh my. So, I'm gonna speed up a little bit here. We, we, we need to do a whole separate uh, tour because this isn't, uh, we have some things here. Watercolors of Jerusalem. Really an extensive collection. Akka uh, and Yaffa. Those three uh, paintings are available in print form. People can order those prints on our website. 
And uh, here we have a jersey of the Palestino soccer team in, in Chile. Yay. <laughs> uh, more dresses. Dresses galore. Uh, I think this particular dress here is, is probably has, it looks like from the Golan Heights or from Syria. It has the distinct pattern on the side. Uh, that's the beautiful dress that we saw at the beginning of the presentation. Uh, this mannequin has eyes. <laughs> <laughs> the Rachel Corey Memorial. It's a 16 foot long uh, mural. And of course, Rachel uh, Corey is an American uh, who tried to stop the bulldozers from destroying homes in Rafa and was bulldozed herself. This is the only piece of art that, that I made. And uh, this is a photo <laughs> of Jerusalem taken from 10,000 feet to 20,000 feet high. You could see the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque in the middle there, right? Uh, let's go back to another section of the museum we haven't been to. Well, Faisal, you, you are letting us all know or definitely illustrating to all of us that yeah. if we haven't made a trip yet to the museum, we it's long overdue. <laughs> this is a, a print by Sahar Kamhawi. Mm -hmm. And uh, is a painting uh, of Haifa. Um, Mautaz, uh, this is by an artist called Mautaz from Gaza. Uh, this one called Immigration, it's a beautiful painting. Those are people who are, who are in red and brown. If you, if you get a little closer, you can see what I'm talking about. And this is by Nahla Asya uh, from Amman. This is a, an abstract for Muhammad Khalil from Betunia near Ramallah. In the corner there, we have three pieces by Khairallah Salim. Uh, he's from Damascus. And uh, these here are by Mahmoud, Mahmoud Zayed. He's from Canada, those two pieces. And uh, the, the big abstract on the wall here is from Ghassan Abu Laban in Amman. Uh, we have a lot of, uh, a lot more here. That's uh, Everything is so beautifully displayed and the lighting yes. and all those windows with natural light. It's just an incredible museum, yeah. if I saw. This is a big cactus painting uh, by Karim Abu Shakra from Amil Fahim. Uh, this is the print uh, of an original by Sam Yahalabi. Uh, it's called Wild City. Uh, now, we have an original here by Nabila Nani, right there. Wow. Faisal, uh, Nita wants to know if you've visited Chile before. No. Okay. Not, Not yet. Not sure why. <laughs> this is a, a, a painting uh, by uh, uh, Isa, Ayman Isa. Okay, this is a painting by uh, Jacqueline Bejani. Uh, and this is uh, a collage by Dia Batal. From, uh, she lives in the UK in London. Uh, we have uh, a painting, uh, a drawing by Kamal Bolata, the famous uh, late Palestinian artist. Um, this is, was in the 70s before he got into all the modern colors and geometrics. Uh, in the early days, he did things like this and has a lot of handwriting on it. Uh, again, uh, Hassan Abu Laban, uh, Rania Matar photographer. These are pictures in Burj al Barajna, I believe. Uh, and that's the same girl who's in the picture there in Beirut on the beach. And uh, Lux Eterna self-photograph here. 
both Aranyas and this one were in the Venice Biennale. And finally, uh, we get to uh, the children's, the Gaza children's drawings. Uh, these drawings were collected from students who, from children who were traumatized and went through uh, art, tra art therapy. And uh, people tried to exhibit them in the US to, with no success until the museum opened for eight years. Nobody was successful because Israel prevented any exhibit from exhibiting them. And uh, these were done after the uh, Israeli attack on Gaza in 2008, 2009, that was called Operation Cast Lead. I was there when that started. I was, I saw the planes take off in the sky and was just devastated when I heard the news. And this is more, yeah, there is a, a large collection of these. And this is a permanent exhibit that's been here for the last five years. Uh, uh, this is uh, Subhiya Hassan, a painting of a girl holding a doll made out of cactus mm. in Gaza in the middle of the destruction. Wow. And on the bright side, this is a, a popular painting uh, of Salah, Salah al -Din, <laughs> uh when he defeated the Crusaders uh, and, and, and uh, liberated Jerusalem. As you can see it in the back there, he's on the white horse. Faisal Nitsa is asking if the children's drawings are part of a permanent collection at the museum. Is that it? Is they are so they okay, they are that's good. Yeah. We're, we're not Take moving care. them, then they're, they're not going anywhere. Look how nice the uh, the mannequins look. In the, oh, it's just it's really lovely, hallway. just beautiful. Yeah, and you can see uh, Rima's painting all the way in the back there in the distance. Uh, yes. under under the last exit sign and actually mm -hmm. see both of them the two of them what a scene huh yeah it's incredible are we gonna walk through that again and uh okay th this is uh sorry for the uh we did it very quickly and uh i don't think we went into this room or did yeah we did go into this room and well, you uh, give everyone an incentive oh and what about that uh this one uh, thing this, I want to show you that we have not seen yeah. this tray. Oh this my tray, goodness. Palestinian uh, authentic tray that uh, Rima brought it here. Wow, it's beautiful. The, uh, exhibit. And it's it's gorgeous. You know, we, we had so many of those at home. Uh, but now you, you, they're hard to find. Right. Yeah, people used to put the dough on them and take it to the uh, public oven and, and, and bake their bread. And what about the bata to the left before you leave the room? Turn around the, the, the clay. What? I mean, I would call it a bata to hold the, the, the zayt. Yeah, those, they used to uh, store olive oil in these in the right. ground. Yeah. So because the Turkish soldiers used to come and steal it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, there's another, <laughs> there's a hallway we didn't show you. Uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll take you there uh, because we, the, the museum is full. We wanted some more space. So these are, uh, I'm going to close the door to prevent the echo here. Uh, so these are 1948, before, before 1948 photographs again. Beautiful sheep. Uh, you may have seen some of these photographs elsewhere. This is a very uh, touching photograph. You could see the British soldiers subduing Palestinian demonstrators brutally. And, and this one person looks like dead on the ground. Uh, beautiful photography of a, a market in Jerusalem during the strike. You could see the, uh, the skylights bringing light and the light shining through on the ceiling down. I, f I feel like I could just walk right into the painting, into the photograph. There's another uh, check-in for IDs by the, by the British soldiers. Uh, these are two uh, photographs that are not part of the museum, but they're part of my work in the building. This is Wadi Rum, mm -hmm. a picture of Wadi Rum where uh, Lawrence Arabia was filmed. And this is a modern day picture of Amman, Jordan that shows you how much, how much limestone there is. 
and we can get closer so you can read some of the signs. Uh, can you read any of the signs there? Ah, uh, no, the, not really. Madaris al Aruba, like right here. You see that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> this is a high resolution photo, super high resolution. Okay, now we have other pictures here. Now, this first picture, this photo, uh, I have people stand in front of it and I take the picture, them, their picture all inside the, and then turn it in black and white and it makes them look like they were there. Oh, how cool. <laughs> all right, so we have more Jerusalem photos. This is the Dome of the Rocks. This is the Holy Sepulcher Church. Um, Whoops. What happened? Hang on. There we go. We're back. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I hit the wrong button by mistake. All right. So a couple more photos here, and then we need, we need to go because some people are. There we go. And all right, so we're gonna head back. Any questions before we wrap up? Krista? No, I don't think so. I think it's just a incredible day here at the Palestine Museum, getting to hear from not only several artists, but get to see all the incredible treasures that you have right there in the museum. It, it's just phenomenal really a gift a gift to the world and uh, you can see the uh the photos yeah we're gonna get some echo here so uh, uh we're gonna say goodbye to everybody so uh as we say at the end bye my salam and yeah, thank you everyone for, you. for tuning in <laughs> thank you thank you everyone for being here today and we look forward to seeing you again in future programming. So mass for them, everyone.